So this last speaker I've known for just about forever, and I've introduced him so many times that I don't even know what to say anymore. He's a great friend, a great speaker, a great person to end this movement, and give it up for JT Everhard. Hi, everybody. Uh, before I get started, all of you who have been here for all these years know the amount of effort that goes into putting on a free conference of this magnitude is tremendous, and there's generally no reward aside from the virtue of doing the actual work. So a couple of the volunteers here have put in a, a tremendous amount of labor, and we have flowers for the two of them. The first uh, is Lauren Lane, who is lead organizer. Uh, and the other, Rebecca, who's new to the staff, who's just uh, devoted her life to this event. So you guys can come here and enjoy yourselves. So give a round of applause for them. Uh, and, and earlier, Re Rebecca Elder here uh, approached me and asked me if I would announce that we're giving flowers to Lauren and Rebecca. And I happen to know that Rebecca has done a tremendous amount of uh, work as well. And I asked her, who's going to give you flowers? She said, I'm an independent woman. I get my own flowers. Um, so I didn't have time to go get Rebecca flowers, but we got you a Hertz donut. And it's not just them, it's Michael Weiss, it's Jeffrey Marcus, it, it's, it, it takes an entire team to put this on. Uh, as I've said every year, having a career in music before being a blogger for a living, how lucky am I, uh, I'm fully aware of how rude it is to ask for a standing ovation, so I would never ever ask anybody to stand up and give the organizers of this event a huge round of applause because God damn it, they've earned it. Now get off the stage, I have a talk to give. <laughs> and before I do, uh, before I came this year, I loaded up pictures from the last seven years. Um, and God, it's just, I don't know about it, if any of you feel the same way, but I've grown up with this event. It, it's not you know, a part of my life the whole year long, but it's become an annual reminder of how much older I'm getting. <laughs> but how much atheism has changed and how much progress we've actually made. And I'm so indebted to it. Uh, every year when I'm here, people come up to me and thank me for organizing the event. And for four years now, I've had to be like, I've had no part in this. It's, it's all them. Uh, but other people come up and say, thank you for laying the groundwork. And I'll, I'll say thank you for that. But I'll also say the best thing I ever did was to leave and get out of their way because they've done so much more with it than I could have ever envisioned. And it's, it's so ironic every year to have, have this annual... Uh, event where I get to come and have my pride for what the organizing team has done overshadow my feelings of inadequacy they cause me. <laughs> but it's still a wonderful time. Well, my name is JT Everhart. As I said, I blog for a living. If you want to help me pay the bills, head over there. Um, this is a story about God's plan for the universe, and it begins as all good stories usually do with the phrase, once upon a time. How much better would the world be if the first four words of the Bible were once upon a time? <laughs> once upon a time, there was a God. And this God believed himself to be all-knowing. And he set his universal intellect and his phenomenal cosmic powers <laughs> to the task of creating a universe. And this universe had a goal. Human beings, us, how flattering is that? Human beings with whom God could have a relationship. Human beings that could live a life of praise and worship before joining God in heaven to praise and worship him forever. This is the story of how this perfect God went about achieving his goal. But before he could work on the universe, God first had to figure out how to kill every human being on the planet. Being all-knowing, God knew that eventually they wouldn't live up to his expectations, 
especially since most people on what would eventually be planet Earth would not even know what his expectations were at the time. And God's solution was to destroy every one of them except for eight. Now, God could have planned around this some other way, but this is how he wanted it. How would he do it? Would he just blink them out of existence painlessly? Would he kill them all by heart attack? I mean, sure, it would hurt a little bit, but it would be relatively fast, and many would go in their sleep. But God didn't do it that way. God determined that he designed his universe in such a way that oxygen deprivation would be one of the most excruciatingly painful ways to die. And when he decided that one day every human being would suffer that fate, except for eight, that's what he decided. And hey, failing to plan is planning to fail, right? <laughs> With this out of the way, God set his mind upon forging a universe. Being infinitely wise, surely the thought of just poofing an earth into existence along with human beings occurred to him. <laughs> Being all-powerful, if God wanted to make man, all God would have had to do was will it to be. He wouldn't even have to go through the unnecessary steps of building man out of dirt. But God did not opt to create the earth and its inhabitants in this way. How did he do it? Well, instead of just blinking the earth into existence, along with humans with whom he'd craved a relationship, God ignited the biggest of bangs. From this big bang came subatomic particles, which congealed according to the laws of nature to form stars, and through those stars formed the heavier elements that would one day make up us, humans and lots of other things, but mostly us. For billions of years this went on, even though God craved a relationship with human beings and could have created them instantly, God was strangely and unnecessarily patient. Now, I know what you're thinking. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense. This isn't generally how we solve problems for which we have an immediate solution. but that's simply how God decided to do it. <laughs> Slow it down. <laughs> Through these billions of years, the universe expanded, growing so large that humans, thanks to the natural restrictions on how fast something can travel that God put into place, would never be able to explore almost all of it. Through all of the time, the universe became rife with rocks and black holes, mindless objects which could give God no compassion, companionship, no conversation, and none of the worship for which he pined, and which would never know an interaction with life of any sort. It was to these objects that God dedicated the sum of virtually all the matter in the universe. It was to these objects that God dedicated virtually all the time in history. A strange way to achieve his goal of a relationship with humans, but that's how God did it. And so it went. For almost 9.3 billion years of natural forces acting upon inanimate objects, until one day, in a galaxy similar to countless others, around a star that was spectacular in its similarity to pretty much every other star of its type, a planet formed that humans would call Earth 4.5 billion years later. <laughs> this planet was able to harbor life, was unable to harbor life, thanks notes, and would, be, and would be unable to harbor life for several million more years, but that was all part of God's plan from the beginning. Rather than just creating a life-friendly planet in a life-friendly universe from the start, God set the stages in motion for a planet that would one day generate an atmosphere and for a time be able to sustain some life, even some humans, though by no means all of them. After long enough, life came into the picture, but not the life that was ultimately God's goal. This life was unthinking, it was unfeeling, and was essentially just chemistry. It was self-replicating molecules and primitive cells and nothing more. 
Yet these would be the building blocks that would eventually produce humans for which God made the cosmos. He had to make the replication of these uh, molecules flawed, for without mutation, how could complexity and functionality ever improve? Now, of course, the clunky replication would essentially result in things like cancer and a whole list of other birth deformities that would cause suffering to people who hadn't even had time in their lives to do wrong. But this is just how God did it. And to make sure the best mutations got passed on with time, God created an environment of competition. Some animals, one day, would simply have to starve or painfully die in countless generations so that positive anomalies could be preserved. One might note that this way is far more cold and far more bloody than simply creating humans or other animals in instantly. But this is just how God chose to do it. And so it was for billions of years, for most of the history of life, that these little bundles of chemistry were the kings of the planet. These lasted a couple billion years until eukaryotes evolved that could reproduce sexually, then simple animals and eventually dinosaurs, which were a bit crap, so fuck them. <laughs> maybe, they were, maybe God was just an Eddie Izzard fan and wanted to give him her material. Now, an all-knowing God would have also realized that a meteor would wipe out the dinosaurs, making them a bit of an unnecessary stepping point to get to the animals whose souls God really cared about. Us. The, <laughs> the only species worthy of a relationship with him. Oh, God. <laughs> and eventually we would come, the first of us showing up by conservative estimates about 100,000 years ago. Now, the first of us knew nothing of God, which is a bit strange considering God had waited all this time for a relationship with humans. But these first humans did know some of the other products of God's design. Tooth decay, hurricanes, disease, starvation, and more. In 13.8 billion years of existence, God had the time to remove these pain-inducing aspects of his design, but he didn't. He also had the time to plan what he would say to these first humans, the creatures God made in his image, the entire point of this whole experiment. Did he say, hi, I'm God. I made you and we have so much to talk about. Or, hi, I'm God and I have some rules I want you to follow. He could have even said, you know how I made you with the instinct to masturbate? Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> One can only wonder why he made us with the instinct to masturbate in the first place. Why couldn't he test our free will by commanding us to not do things we generally don't want to do? Don't make clothing out of thorns or you'll go to hell. <laughs> it's the goof of all time. One can only wonder why God endowed human beings with instincts when he one day planned to set the rules in opposition. But I digress. God could have also said, hi, I'm God. Sorry about making germs, but if you wash your hands before eating or after wiping your ass, it'll go a long way towards keeping you well. Good guy, God. But God said none of that. After waiting billions of years to finally meet the first humans, the species with whom God so craved a relationship, God said nothing. After the universe finally bore out humans, enabling God to have the relationship and the praise he so desired, God left us truly alone to fend for ourselves. And God kept saying nothing for another 98,000 years. With hell as the punishment for breaking particular rules, God made no effort to explain to these primitive human beings what his rules were. So for 98,000 years, Humans learned how to survive this planet, which God made for life, but which strangely included a myriad of ways to suffer and to die, which discriminated, not based on the kindness of one's heart, but which slightly favored genetic makeup. I mean, if you were faster than your friend, regardless of whether or not you were a more moral person, 
you got to be the one to live and to pass on your genes. Now, many humans realized that outsmarting the challenges of their environment was the best way to live. Using their brains, these humans worked to find solutions to the challenges of God's creation that it threw at them. Those who relied on God to feed them, oh, they starved. But those who realized that the universe operates under a set of rules, and they could figure out those rules, discovered new ways to live more comfortably. And there were other benefits to this as well such as the greater ability to figure out when some of their cohabitants on planet Earth were lying to them. And those who believed, despite all the evidence to the contrary, no matter how strong their faith that relief would come from outside forces rather than from their own effort, were always met with disappointment, and often deadly disappointment. The smartest of humans learned to create fire to keep warm during the harsh winters. Perspicacious farmers conceived of the wheel to make wheelbarrows, and after enough of their loved ones died of starvation, we figured out new ways to hunt and to fish. As I've always said, by this light, every human innovation was a testament to the uselessness of prayer. And this tradition carries through even to today, when we got sick of hurricanes bullshit and eventually invented satellite weather radar. Though that wouldn't have helped almost every human being ever. You know, the ones who lived before that innovation and whose only hope for advance warning of hurricanes was the God who designed hurricanes to approach silently in the first place. Perhaps God was simply very shy in interacting with humans for the first time. After all, he had waited 13.8 billion years for this moment. God also watched as human beings began to suspect that there was some kind of divine architect. God watched as sect after sect came up with incorrect ideas about how God had done things. Was it turtles all the way down? Was the earth the product of two celestial wolves doing the nasty? <laughs> Countless religions were conceived, all of them wrong, and God said nothing until finally, 98,000 years after the first human beings appeared on the scene, by conservative estimates, and after 13.8 billion years of waiting, God decided to set the record straight. How would he do this? Well, God could have appeared to every human being throughout all of history, communicating his wishes clearly. I mean, after all, if you want a relationship with someone, it would seem that making sure they knew you existed would be a priority. But God did not do this. Instead, after watching millennia after millennia of human beings writing inaccurate books while claiming to be inspired by God, God actually inspired a few people in a largely illiterate region of the world to write a book. But rather than inspiring them to write about the history of the earth and the universe as it truly was, Knowing that one day human beings would be able to figure out the actual history of life and of the universe, God inspired his chosen authors to record an account that dealt only with an incredibly small region of one planet in a universe with more planets than grains of sand on the earth. And he also inspired his chosen authors to record an account that did not match up with the truth just like the holy books based upon the imaginations of founders of every other false religion with which Christianity would share the earth. This record would include a talking snake and a talking donkey in a world where animals do not speak. This account would include all of the stars being made on the same day in a universe where stars are still being made and would continue being made for a very long time. In God's truly inspired book, the earth is created before the sun and the stars, when God surely knew that this was not how it truly happened. I mean, not only was God there to see it, he's all-knowing. God also inspired his writers to include passages that depicted plants coming before stars as well, and that whales came before reptiles, all of this is the opposite of the way it really happened. And God knew that one day we would figure it out. Yet he inspired the first authors of the Bible to include all of this in the very first book, much of it in the very first chapter. 
of all the ways God could have made himself known to us, his most treasured species, this way, he determined with infinite wisdom, was surely the best. Later in his book, God would lay out many of his rules and the punishment for disobedience by communicating them to a handful of people, just as the fake gods of other religions had done, rather than to, you know, everybody. These punishments would not be meted out by God, of course, but by his chosen species that he knew would develop empathy, like the rat talk we just saw. And God made it so that killing people for understandable transgressions, like making love to someone without the proper ceremony, or working on the wrong day, would cause significant psychological damage to those dispensing God's prescribed punishments. God presumably thought it was a better plan for his followers to live with murdering their neighbors and the trauma that brought on, rather than for God to carry out his own punishments. In short, he's no Ned Stark. <laughs> and just as God knew what happened, after creating humans with certain tendencies and declaring rules in contrast to those tendencies, of those who even tried to abide by God's rules, nobody managed. So as he had planned since before he created the first particle, it was now time to kill almost every human, and not with gentleness. Now was the time to condemn every human, most of whom had never heard of the book he inspired a few men to write, To Death by Drowning. And what were their crimes? Undoubtedly, some of them were murderers but far more had made love to the man or woman who would eventually become their spouse, but had dared to do so before the proper ritual had been performed. For God, the punishment was all severe and all the same. Perhaps God watched this agony. Perhaps God saw this collection of suffering equaled only in hell and wondered if he should have made less stringent rules. If so, one can only assume the thought did not linger. God is all wise after all. Which is probably why he inspired his writers to include passages describing him as a God of justice and love, lest successive generations get the wrong idea. One can only wonder what God wished to accomplish, since murdering everybody on the planet would not change human nature. I mean, did God think that killing everybody would make people less tempted to have sex before marriage? So after the deed was done, God cleaned up after himself, including any evidence of a global flood, knowing full well that this would cast doubt on the Bible when the discipline of geology was better developed. And after a few thousand years of watching the approach of committing global genocide not work to make people stop working on the Sabbath, and what's more, being all-knowing, God would have known from the moment he implemented the plan to murder almost every human being that it wouldn't work, but he went ahead anyway. After watching that plan fail, God came up with a whole new plan. He would arrange to have a son, and arrange to have that son brutally murdered. Now sure, God could just change the rules, or just not send people to hell, or send them someplace else like a less nice heaven, or to Mississippi or something, but... <laughs> okay, hell, fine. But God figured that he had to be fair and just, and what was more just than punishing an innocent for crimes that other people committed? So, God impregnated Mary in an age where religion, in an age and a region where sex out of wedlock often meant the life of the non-virgin, and one, this is actually thanks in large part to the rules God set up when he had his first chat with Moses as a burning bush. And the context of Mary's miraculous pregnancy would lead several people to believe that Mary had premarital sex, as most humans do, and was simply lying to protect her reputation and her life. After all, the odds of premarital sex combined with dishonesty are much greater than the odds of a virgin birth. God would have known this, but decided to still go with the virgin pregnancy instead of just poofing into existence, Jesus into existence anyway. Thankfully, God's son Jesus was eventually born and kicked around for about 30 years before he finally started performing miracles to prove his godliness. Now sure, lots of people died without salvation during that 30 year stretch, but remember back to when God was watching the universe do its thing for 13.8 billion years before the first human beings showed up? I mean, if anything, 
God is patient and won't be hurried by members of the species he loves and with whom he wants a relationship burning in hell for all of eternity. So Jesus walked around performing miracles for a fraction of the population of a small region of the planet. And some of those people for whom Jesus didn't perform miracles supposedly killed him, after which Jesus rises from the dead in front of a handful of his followers. <laughs> and by now, the plan is in place. These people who saw Jesus rise will go out into the world and say, I saw a man rise from the dead. You don't get to see it, but I saw it, and you should believe me. Those who believe this claim, while rejecting the outlandish claims of competing religions, will be forgiven, regardless of their misdeeds in life. And everyone else will suffer forever, despite their virtues in life. For a God who created the cosmos, it seems the minimum expectation would be for this God to be more clever than humans. Yet to any religious people watching this talk, how clever is this God? Really? Do you honestly believe that you could have done no better in planning out the universe? Would you have made it without cancer? Would you have made infants immune to AIDS? Would you have put enough food on the planet to feed every person? Would you have made people reliant on food in the first place? But it's not just the ineptitude of God's tactics that resonates with me. It's the maliciousness. God knew one day he would kill virtually every inhabitant of the world for failing to live up to rules most of them had never heard of and which were created in opposition to the instincts with which we were created. And God elected to kill man and animal in one of the most excruciating ways he designed. He created human beings with a brain incapable of believing, uh, incapable of having belief changed by force of will. Think about it. How many of you could walk to the edge of a skyscraper and just decide that gravity doesn't work? None of you. Our brains will simply not allow us to believe the apparently preposterous just because we want to. And after making us with these brains, God created a hell and made salvation from it, not based upon how compassionate a person is or how compassionate they were in life, but upon their ability to believe a man rose from the dead, a claim that violates every way we know the universe to work, a claim for which the only evidence we have is the testimony of a handful of people surrounded by liars claiming to have, to have witnessed the power of gods in every other religion. You guys know this guy? Hi, Ben. <laughs> we should be grateful to have no knowledge that this God exists. He doesn't exist, and that's all right. Even if God doesn't abhor suffering, we do. Even if God thinks cancer is a vital part of existence, we don't. In a world bountiful with ways to suffer and die, over the years we've managed to think our way around many of them, and we're getting better at it all the time. And we share our discoveries because we care about the well-being of our neighbors, even if the universe doesn't. The absence of answered prayers is a vacuum filled with the compassion of humankind. There is someone looking out for you, and it's me. It's your loved ones. It's your friends. It's other Christians, and it's other atheists. It's people of all stripes, all colors, and all creeds. If our ability to overcome tribulation has taught us anything, it's that figuring out what is true matters, which means it's important we be able to tell each other when we think the other is wrong. But it's also important that we continue to work together rather than existing as warring tribes. Ask previous generations. The world already presents enough threats to us without adding each other into the mix. That means we have to be patient. 
It means we have to assume the best of each other until there's reason to do otherwise. And this is something atheists can be remarkably bad at. And we have to be intellectually honest with ourselves rather than simply trying to win conversations. But above all, we must pursue the truth by examining the world and making honest, intelligent conclusions. And who among us can honestly conclude that God, if he exists, wasn't exactly the most clever of planner when he came to the universe? And that no God with the intelligence to make a universe would ever use this plan to demonstrate his wisdom. It's clear. It's abundantly clear. It's so you could bet your life on it obvious that it's time to stop believing and to stop relying on a God this inept. I can forgive a compassionate idiot. What I can't forgive is maliciousness. So not only does this God not exist, we should be grateful he doesn't exist, but don't worry. Because human beings have been making our own story for some time now. Our once upon a time is still running. It's not perfect, but we've done much better than any God. And we're going to be okay. Thank you. I feel like I've grown up with so many of you doing Skepticon over the years. It means the world to me to see each and every one of you here every year. And hopefully Skepticon 8 will be even better, though I'm not exactly sure how that could be. I guess we'll find out then. You doubt me? No, I'm just really impressed with Skepticon 7. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>